Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 1058 for May 26th, 2024. Coming up in a few minutes. Obviously, if we make a small amount of profit, we like to invest that back into the business to fill more casks to be more profitable in the future. But we're also beholden to our local area and our members. So we take a slice of that profit and we give them to local community grants. Glen Wibis Distillery in Dingwall, Scotland isn't your typical distillery. It's owned by around 3,800 shareholders who invested through a series of crowdfunding campaigns. And as a community-owned enterprise, it reinvests part of its profits back into the Dingwall community. Distillery manager Matthew Farmer joins us later on WhiskeyCast In-Depth to explain what else makes Glen Wibis unique. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, Behind the Label, and much more. The news is next on this week's WhiskeyCast. Hey everyone, it's me, Gabriel Cartarella with yours, and I'm here to introduce you to something very special. We've gone and blended the time-honored whiskey craftsmanship of Scotland with the whiskey-making finesse of Japan. And let me tell you, it's something truly remarkable. More on that in a minute. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Robin Redbreast? You may have seen me around. Face label, label face. Yeah, that's the one. I'm now contractually obligated to be their spokesbird. <laughs> yeah, my agent didn't read the small print. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. Wild Turkey has opened a new visitor's center at the distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, and named it for longtime master distiller Jimmy Russell. 2024 marks Jimmy's 70th anniversary at Wild Turkey, and the Jimmy Russell Wild Turkey Experience features two new tasting rooms, an outdoor pavilion for special events, and the Generations Lounge, dedicated to the three generations of Russells working at Wild Turkey. Scotch whiskey industry leaders are nervous about the upcoming U.S. presidential election. Industry representatives from the Scotch Whiskey Association and other leaders were in Washington this week to lobby U.S. politicians. They're afraid a Donald Trump victory could lead to the resumption of tariffs on Scotch whiskey imports. Scotch whiskey was collateral damage during the Trump administration in the long-running dispute between the U.S., the U.K., and the European Union over aircraft subsidies. The Trump administration imposed a 25% tariff on imports of single malt whiskies from the UK as part of a tit-for-tat tariff the Europeans imposed on bourbon and other American-made whiskies. Those tariffs were suspended under the Biden administration while all sides worked toward resolving the aircraft subsidy and imported steel disputes. The suspension is scheduled to end early next year after the next president takes office. Meanwhile, the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States has received a $300,000 grant from the U.S. Agriculture Department to promote American-made spirits in India. It's part of a program designed to expand market opportunities for U.S. food and agricultural products. Currently, almost 60% of those exports go to Canada, Mexico, the European Union, and China. The grant brings the total amount the U.S. is investing in spirits export promotion through Discus to $1.4 million this year. New whiskeys to mention this week. Whistlepig has released Camp Stock, a wheat and rye blended whiskey, as part of a promotion with the makers of the Solo Stove. The whiskey was made using barrel staves toasted with a Solo Stove, and the barrels were eventually recycled into whiskey barrel firewood for the Solo Stove. A limited edition combination featuring camp stock, a solo stove Mesa XL, and a batch of firewood for $199.99 is available now on the Whistlepig website. The bottles will be available at the website and at retailers for $74.99 a bottle. There's a lot going on in the world of sport this summer, and the folks behind Great Drams have released the Summer of Sport, a 10-year-old sherry cask matured blended scotch. It's available in the U.K. with just 200 bottles available. There's no word on pricing. 
Woodford Reserve had an accident at the distillery several years ago, and the result is the latest distillery series bottling. Woodford Reserve toasted bourbon was created when a batch of barrels intended for Woodford Double Oaked was delivered to the distillery and filled with new-make bourbon spirit. Those barrels are heavily toasted and lightly charred, compared to the standard Woodford barrels, which are lightly toasted and heavily charred. Eighteen barrels were filled before the distillery team caught the mistake, but the team decided to see what would happen with the whiskey. It took six years, but the Woodford Reserve Toasted Bourbon is on sale now at the distillery for sixty four ninety nine a bottle. Westland Distillery is releasing edition four of Caleri, its outpost series whiskey that explores the flavors heritage strains of barley can produce. This edition of Caleri was distilled from Fritz Barley, produced at Washington State University's The Bread Lab. Westland has partnered with The Bread Lab for years to come up with unique whiskeys in collaboration with local farmers. Around 3,000 bottles will be available in the U.S. at a price tag of $149.99 each. Heaven Hill is out with the year's second batch of Larceny Barrel Proof Weeded Bourbon. Batch B524 is bottled at 62.7% ABV and will carry a recommended retail price of $64.99 a bottle. There's also a batch B524 of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. This batch is 11 years and 2 months old and bottled at 65.3% ABV. It carries a recommended retail price of $74.99 a bottle. I'll have my tasting notes for both soon at whiskeycast.com. And finally, from Spain's Bodegas Jaime comes the Bellos Single Malt Signature Vermouth Cask. It's finished in 80-year-old vermouth barrels. Just 700 bottles will be available in the initial release. It's available through the Termion Vermouth website for 35 euros a bottle. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com and in the WhiskeyCast community app. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. Let's check the calendar and see what's happening around the world of whiskey. The Isla Festival of Malt and Music continues all week long through Saturday on Isla. Tickets are still available for Bourbon's Bistro's Woodford Reserve Dinner Wednesday night in Louisville, Kentucky. The Whiskey Exchange has a tasting of Glen Farkless Family Casks on Wednesday night at its Great Portland Street shop in London. Whiskey and all that is this Saturday at Air Town Hall in Air, Scotland. Sunday is the Whiskey Event in London, and next Thursday, June 6th, is the Whiskey X in Atlanta. If you're organizing a Whiskey Event, let us know about it. We'll add it to the calendars at WhiskeyCast.com and in the WhiskeyCast community app. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Kentucky and Ireland have plenty in common. Two homes of horse racing. Mm -hmm. Bluegrass music is said to have Irish roots. Um, okay, it's not the longest list, but the Redbreast Kentucky Oak Edition only strengthens the bond. Finished in sustainably sourced Kentucky Oak for a captivating nose and round taste. I see a triple crown in this thoroughbred's future. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin and the Classic Malts lineup. Distilleries are intended to make money for their owners, but what if there were a different ownership scheme, one that prioritized community ownership and impact over pure profit? I know what you're thinking. That sounds a lot like socialism. But let's look at one Scottish distillery where community ownership puts profits to work in the community, namely the town of Dingwall. Glen Wivis Distillery opened in 2017 following a crowdfunding campaign that saw more than 3,000 people invest in the distillery's construction. It's one of the few successful crowdfunding campaigns for a distillery on record and has already started to put money back into the Dingwall community. 
Matthew Farmer is the distillery manager, one of just four employees at the site, and we connected on a Zoom call this week. One of the things I like to do when we bring somebody new onto the show for the first time is get your background. Uh, where did you get started in the distilling industry? So I'm a little bit of a hybrid. Um, I'm born in Scotland, but actually I got my cut my teeth in America. Um, we moved about a lot. My dad ended up moving to Seattle. Um, we tagged along. And it was the craft distilling boom in Washington um, that really got me into it. I was a chef before that. Um getting into the point where I'd done it for so long that it was going to be a career. Um, and then craft distilling started in Washington, kind of off the back of craft brewing, finally legalized. We had dry fly and Puget Sound spirits and all of that kind of break the seal on it. Um, I started at a tiny little place next to a winery uh, called Softail Spirits at the time making grappa. So I was a Scottish person in America making Italian grappa, <laughs> which... There is there is some some disconnect there, I think, but yeah. it was really interesting. <laughs> um, it really developed a love for grappa. Um, one of the few people in the Scottish Highlands that will still order grappa at the end of a meal um, if they have it. So cut my teeth there, um, and then there was a. I think whiskey was still probably in my blood somehow. So when there was a distillery done down the road called Woodenville Whiskey um, that was just starting, um, kind of was at a point in my life where I could do a night shift. So got in there um and then it just sort of snowballed out of control uh, if you know woodenville whiskey that place got oh, bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger um eventually purchased by lvmh and then covid hit, and me and my wife were, had a family and we were thinking about where we wanted our daughters to grow up and eventually sort of this job at when with us in the scottish highlands got moving back home arose and a couple of months later was on a plane um and the rest is history Tell me about the distillery. So the distillery is really unique. Um, it's small by Scottish standards. Um, one of the things about moving over to Scotland is that I think the sense of scale here is a little bit different. Um, any distillery producing less than a million litres a year is somehow a hobby distillery um, compared to the big guys around. So we only make about fifty to 75,000 litres a year, um, only have four full-time employees uh, the big thing about Glenwood this facility is that it's community owned. So it was literally funded by a Kickstarter, a crowd funder. Um, and the legal structure is different than a limited company with directors or owners. Every single person who invested in Glenn Withis is a part owner. So we have 3,800 members, 3,800 owners, um, and they all get a single vote in the facility at the AGM, um, regardless of how much money they put in. And we exist for the benefit of our community. So obviously, if we make a small amount of profit, we like to invest that back into the business to fill more casks, to be more profitable in the future. But we're also beholden to our local area and our members. So we take a slice of that profit and we give them to local community grants, um, literally sort of like might be £500 to the local school or £800 to the local uh, charity sort of Kaylee or, or music band. Um, but it all adds up. Um, and that's sort of like the purpose of Glen Withis is making and selling this whiskey so that we can keep that money in the community and feed it back. This is really one of the first community distilleries, isn't it? As far as I know, um, we we do tentatively say, I think we're the world's first. Um, if there is one in the far reaches of the world that we haven't been able to Google, uh, there might still be one. But as far as I know, yeah, this is the first and by far probably the, the biggest. I know the Cabrac Trust is putting together the Cabrac Distillery as a, something similar to help benefit the local community. Exactly. Yeah. So um, we, we've had a, a wee bit of talk sort of like telling them about the challenges and the tribulations they'll face. Um, but no, I mean, I think being able to see there's a, there's a sense, I think when with Scotch whiskey in particular, um, you're using Scotch barley, Scottish water, Scottish labor, Scottish talent, um, keeping that money in Scotland, making it for a good cause using all this history and tradition for the, the greater good, I think is, it, it strikes a chord with people, especially around here. Tell me about the uh, community aspect of it. Uh, you crowdfunded the entire distillery off of a, a Kickstarter campaign. I remember covering that Kickstarter campaign back in, I think, 2016 or so. And 
to see what you've done since then is just amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it has been uh, a madness for sure. I think when we started that crowdfunding campaign, obviously we were still part of the European Union um, and there wasn't any sort of like global pandemics on the horizon. So I think the idea behind the distillery has had to survive quite a few changes. Um, We make gin. Um, We were designed to sort of like make the gin and that was going to make so much money that it was going to let us make all this whiskey in the background and, and sort of let it sit for eight years, 10 years, and we'd eventually be this big Scotch whiskey distillery. Um, COVID hit and, you know, cash flows and energy crises and wars in Ukraine and um, everything goes through the roof. And so we had to we had to move our plans up a little bit. It's like if we we're going to survive as a community owned distillery, like we don't have a bank keeping us afloat during these hard times. We don't have uh, an owner or a single owner or investor who's willing us to bankroll us to see us through. Um, we have to we have to kind of go paycheck by paycheck. Um, and so we sort of like moved up our whiskey a little bit. Um, at the time, there weren't a lot of whiskey distilleries releasing three-year-old or four-year-old Scotch whiskey. There wasn't a lot of... Um, there wasn't a lot of a, a market for that and there wasn't a lot of templates that you could look at and say, well, that was successful. Let's copy that. Um, we had to basically make it up ourselves, um, putting together these young whiskies and, and keeping the the company sort of like moving and going along. And all the time you're doing this, you also have to be making all this whiskey in the background because if you take your foot off that accelerator, suddenly 10 years down the line, there's not going to be any 2022 or 2023 whiskey. Um So it's been, I I think if you looked at the plans for distillery in 2016 versus where we are right now, um, there's definitely been quite a few changes, but the ethos and the goal is exactly the same. um, And we're still here. You're also one of the few sustainable distilleries of that era. You You guys were sustainable before it became a thing. Yes, before it was cool, let's say. Um, we made the decision back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, there there was reasons for that decision. At the time, the, the government was giving a lot of grants for um, people putting in biomass boilers and running off renewable energy. Um, we were one of the first people to cram a biomass boiler into a distillery to produce steam. Um, and so we still, we still have people come up and visit us to see exactly how we run it. Um, Because it's not as easy as just switching off your steam source for another type of boiler. Um, Biomass, imagine shoveling fuel like it, you know, it's not a direct fired still, but it's kind of similar. Like if you put more wood chip in, the fire gets bigger, which produces more steam. And so your steam flow throughout the day is constantly going up and down and up and down. You can't just set your distillation and forget it or your mashing. Your temperatures are always fluctuating. Um, so it's a very hands-on process. We're always running back and forth between the boiler. We're, we're managing electricity usage. Like you don't just switch onto a renewable energy and say, all right, the planet's saved. Um, you have to do the, the hard work on the other side because it requires a different way of operating the distillery as well. Explain. So imagine you've got a mash going on. Um, you're trying to get up to your second water, water temperature. So you you need to hit about like 70, 75 degrees Celsius. So the typical way to do this would be to flow your water through a heat exchanger. So steam goes in one side, water comes out the other side. And the amount that that heat exchanger is open dictates the temperature that your water gets onto. And mashing is like cooking. Like it requires like pretty consistent temperatures to keep those enzymes, make sure you're not like completely denaturing them, um, but to get them out. Um, and it ge- is generally happier when you have this nice consistent curve rather than hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, so you set your valve, let's say it's like 40% open. You've got this nice steam flow. Um, but then all of a sudden, oh, you've got like a big twig in your wood chip boiler. Um, the twig gets caught in the auger. The whole thing shuts off. Uh, so you have to run downstairs, open up the boiler, get the twig out of the thing, close it all up, run back upstairs. And by the time you've done it, your 40% steam setting. Now your water is at like 60 degrees Celsius instead of 77 degrees. And so that that's kind of the thing that happens throughout the day. You're constantly running back and forth and trying to manage this slightly finicky steam flow on one side with 
a process that really requires a very consistent even temperature every single day. Um, it's one of the, our, our our operators, like you know, you get the the watches and stuff that measure your steps. You're you're usually putting in about twenty twenty five thousand steps a day, back and forth between the boiler. What other growing pains have you experienced? Um, the biggest one for us, I think, has actually been um, trying to communicate exactly what we are. Uh, I think when we go out to the market with a three or four year old whiskey, um, I take it as a certain compliment that when people try it, they, they're like, oh, this is actually, there's a lot of depth, there's a lot of complexity here. Um, it's very well packaged. I think people think that we are a lot bigger than we are or that there is a lot more funding behind us than there actually is. Um, when we actually get people up to the distillery and they see that there's only four people here and we're doing everything from bringing the malt in to filling casks to blending the whiskey to selling it to keeping all the finances to managing 3,800 members. Um, getting that story across, like most brands are all about your USPs or whatever, right? Like pick the one thing that's special and shout it out from the rooftops and that's your brand story and you were made 300 years ago or something. Our brand story is very complicated. Our brand story is like, there's like a list of 10 things that we're doing that other distilleries aren't doing and condensing that into a nice short soundbite for, um, well, for a podcast um, is quite difficult. Well, don't worry about shortening it. Go ahead and <laughs> go ahead and explain. I do tend to ramble a little bit, so I apologize. But no worries. When you've got the... Um, you, we've obviously got the community angle of it. Um, and that's always like, I think people have to kind of get their head around that because we're not quite a charity, but we're very, very close. And Scotch whiskey has always been associated with a, a certain amount of opulence and large companies and big revenues and profit margins and all that kind of thing. Um, getting across that slightly scrappier version where we're a, a community owned distillery, um, we're finally at the point where it's making a difference. Um, we did a £10,000 to the local community in 2023. And this year, we actually gave away £20,000 in the form of these small community grants. Um, and you start to see it now. You go down into the high street or you you sort of like talk to the local members of the local community. And there there's usually one Glen with this backed project that they have either been involved in or heard about that's made a difference in their lives. And I think that's starting to bring that message across a little bit. Um, there's the environmental aspect as well, which we try and make sure that it's not just greenwashing. Like we're not just saying we're environmentally sustainable because that's a bit of a, a, a talking point in the industry right now, but sort of like trying to actually get across the things that we're doing and the differences that we're making. And then the whiskey itself, like a three to four year old vintage style release whiskey. We haven't necessarily made it easy on ourselves trying to get that across as well. Not many people are doing vintage style release whiskeys as well. Um, and get, just getting people to try it, keeping, keeping that open mind for people, making sure that they're um, not coming in with preconceived notions or if they do, uh, trying to make sure that we we do maybe like a blind tasting or something to to get them around the the three to four year old kind of stigma um because we're we're completely open we're completely transparent we're not doing any no not age statements we're not trying to hide it but sometimes that comes with just as much work you've got the uh 2018 and 2019 releases when will you release a 2020 working on it right now i know we're on zoom right now so i can pan the camera just over to my my desk of samples over there um <laughs> Every year is a little bit, uh, now I can't put the camera on, of course. So every year is a little bit different. Um, that's quite kind of the exciting thing is that because we're doing this vintage style release and because we've been a small distillery, like we don't necessarily have a cask budget of like, you know, a hundred grand to go out and buy Pedro Jimenez casks directly from Spain every single year and have a consistent recipe. Um, our cask and our wood policy has has also been a little bit scrappy. It's sort of like, what, what do we think is going to work with our spirit? What's available right now? What's looking good? I don't want to buy a cask just because the recipe says that we need this cask. Um, if a batch of Saturns comes in and they're fresh and they're going for a good price and people are looking for a customer, yeah, we'll take them. Um, and that's actually some of the samples on my desk right now. We're, we're using this sort of like Saturn influence for the 2020 vintage that could be really interesting. 
Um, but that does mean that almost every single year you are back to the drawing board. You are creating samples from scratch. Um, you get a better idea. You get, you get better at it. Um, you have an idea of what might work. But inevitably, the first one you put together is always usually not very good. And then, then you sort of like refine it and, and clarify it from there. Did your background as a chef help you uh, with blending? Oh, I'd like to think so. Um, I was uh, we we did uh, we were very used to bold flavors, and I think the idea that um, you know, I was I was like a, a we were doing Vietnamese fusion, and when you break down sort of like a, a pho or a Vietnamese curry or something, and you see it's like it's like thirty different spices. It's absolutely mad the amount that goes in there. Um, you know, me at home, I could throw together thirty different ingredients, and it could just taste like brown. Um. For, for a proper recipe, put them all together and they all sing and they all harmonize. The casks are very similar. Like when we throw together, like you can throw together a bourbon and a sherry and a, a moscatel or something. And it just sort of like tastes bleh. It just tastes like malt and whiskey. Um, but if you get the ratios right, if you get the sort of like really bright fruity one and you get the deep rich one and you put them together just right, they do become a better, better than the sum of their parts. So a lot of it is not getting discouraged sometimes when you're doing like 10 or 15 samples and they're just not coming together. It's all about the, it's all about the ratios. It's all about knowing that these are all good flavors individually and let's bring them in together into something bigger. How do you manage 3,000 owners? <laughs> um, with, with great difficulty, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> Um, a lot of them, I will say, our members are absolutely wonderful. Um, we don't have a lot of members who are here for short-term return or um, are looking to get really hands-on with sort of like the whiskey making side of things. Um, a lot of our members have come on board for the community or social, social aspects. And I think because we're a whiskey distillery, there is this sort of like inbuilt expectation that Good whiskey can take five years, eight years, 15 years. Socially responsible enterprise can also take that long. Like you don't just give £10,000 away and expect to see everybody happy. Um, it takes time to build and invest in these social infrastructures that are going to make a difference. And so I think people's expectations for seeing that return kind of line up with, with the whiskey and the social side. Um that said, we do have some particularly enthusiastic members and we rope them in to become directors of the society. So if they have a, an awful lot of free time and a lot of passion and a lot of patience, um, all of the directors here at Glen Glibis are completely volunteers. So they are from our membership um, and they take on a more sort of official role in sort of stewarding the company forward. Um, and they only stand for three years, and then they sort of pass the baton on to the next batch. It's a great way to get your members involved, isn't it? It is, yes. They act as a certain um, level, because they're really there to make sure that we are acting in the best interest of the community. Um, and that's the interesting thing when you're doing a distillery. It's like, yes, we could increase production, but is that actually in the best interests of what we're doing? For, for a whiskey distillery, increasing production should be a fairly um, easy thing um, to say yes to. But sometimes we have to think about, well, is that going to use more water in the local area? Um, are we going to need other consents in order to do this? Are we going to make extra noise? Like, is this really what the community wants? Um and you have to factor that in. It's, a, it's an extra level of like decision making that me as a production person, um, it's not necessarily the first thing that comes to my mind. So having the members be actually on the director, on the board of directors for the company, make sure that you have these sort of like voice, not voices or reason, but maybe voices of um, from outside, from other perspectives that are making sure that the the company is working in the way that it was always intended to. They kind of see it from an outside perspective. You're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the distillery here in a couple of years. Fast forward 10 more years. What does success look like for Glenn with us? Oh, 10 years from now, it feels, I would say it feels so far away, but this first 10 years has gone very, very fast sometimes as well. 
I think from 10 years from now, I think if if Glenn Willis can be um, a staple in the Dingwall community, um, I think that right now we're still sort of in that startup phase where people are sort of like getting used to the idea of us being here and um, getting used to our products. But I think by the time we've had another 10 years of community grant giving and hopefully dividends to our members and have grown our community a little bit. Um, I would like to see Dingwall um, and the surrounding area and the high street just um, have a little bit more life to it. Um, People up here, we're, we're definitely conscious of sort of like the, there's not many tourists who come in and stop and stay on these small Scottish high streets um, and whiskey tourism is a big way to bring them back. And if we can liven that situation up a little bit with what we're doing uh, and bring people to see us, uh, I think that would be the biggest part of success for us. Thanks to Matthew Farmer for joining us this week on Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Lagavulin, an award-winning single malt scotch from Isla, world-renowned for its balanced, smoky, and peaty taste. Discover Lagavulin's full lineup at malts.com. Let's start off the What I'm Tasting This Week department with the latest little book release from Freddie No and Suntory Global Spirits. Path Not Taken blends several vintage ryes together with an 18-year-old bourbon. It's bottled at 59.1% ABV. The nose has touches of baking spices, oak, black cherries, and honey. The taste is spicy and thick with intense cinnamon and clove notes, while brown sugar, honey, and oak add balance and complexity in the background. The finish is long and dry with lingering spices and a touch of black cherries. I'm scoring the little book Path Not Taken Whiskey a 93. Next up, The Tempest from Rare Hair Spirits. I mentioned this one on the news a couple of weeks ago. It's a 20-year-old Australian single malt from Hellyer's Road Distillery, finished for three years in port wine casks. It's bottled at 42% ABV, and the nose has touches of grape jam, stewed prunes, raisins, dried tropical fruits, and just a hint of oak. The taste is spicy with black pepper and allspice notes, red grapes and raisins in the background. The finish is long and spicy, and to be honest, the spices overwhelm the palate in my opinion. I'm scoring the Tempest from Rare Hair Spirits a 90. Finally, let's look at the M&H Elements Peated Single Malt from Israel's Milk and Honey Distillery. This one is matured in a combination of ex-bourbon and ex-isla casks and bottled at 46% ABV. The nose has a subtle smokiness along with touches of lemon zest, tropical fruits, honey, and vanilla. The taste is thick and chewy with a gentle smokiness, notes of white pepper, clove, and allspice, and touches of tropical fruits and honey underneath. The finish is long and spicy with a kiss of smoke, and I'm scoring the M&H Elements Peated Single Malt a 92. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of more than 3,700 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. Juris has truly been innovative in perfecting cast finishing, which has led to exceptional expressions of our craftsmanship. This extra step allows our whiskey to further mature in carefully selected casks and marks the final stage of our double aging process, or in Juris case, our double double aging method, resulting in unique indulgent tasting experiences. The new Juris double double 21 year Mizanara oak cask finish undergoes a meticulous four stage aging process, including being finished and sought after Japanese Mizunara oak casks. Crafting these casks is challenging due to the non-straight growth of Mizunara oak, and it takes 200 years for these trees to reach full potential. The result? A masterfully balanced whiskey with notes of sandalwood, coconut, and creamy vanilla, to name a few. And while it's not the easiest to find, it's an unmissable experience. Let's open up the inbox and see what the Whiskey Cast community is talking about this week. Our community segment is presented by Waterford Whiskey. Pete at Whiskey Ranked posted this note in the app. Last night, a new co-worker and I ordered whiskeys for each other and tasted them blind. There were over 25 whiskeys on the shelf and we both picked the same one. 
I think I'm going to like working with her. By the way, it was Writer's Tears Redhead that they both picked. Chris celebrated a birthday this week. Happy birthday, Chris. And he posted a photo of the bottles he received from friends and family, a peerless small-batch bourbon, last year's Dewar's 19-year-old Champions Edition, and a Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey. Chris commented, It's nice when people get to know you more than the generic Jack or Jameson. Turning to the Xbox now, at Bunkai H posted this comment on last week's interview with Scott Lang of Ardenaho Distillery. Glad to see Ardenaho releasing a single malt. It will be interesting over the next seven years as they release more mature single malts. That it will. If you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, download the free WhiskeyCast community app and join the conversation. You can also reach us on X, Threads, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. And the email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Our community segment is presented by Waterford Whiskey on the web at waterfordwhiskey.com. Every Irish single farm origin gives completely different flavours when it's malted, fermented, distilled and matured. That's why we're exploring Irish terroir. Imagine how many flavours we find working with over a hundred of them. Waterford Whiskey, the most naturally flavoursome single malt. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Balconis Distilling. This week we have a vocabulary lesson. The word for the week is sacrification. That's the scientific term for the conversion of starches in grain into sugars during the mashing process. Hot water breaks down the grain and cooks the starchy inside into sugars. Those sugars can then be converted into alcohol during the fermentation process as the yeast consumes them and releases alcohol. That's saccharification. Officially, it's defined as any chemical change where a monosaccharide molecule remains intact after being unbound from another saccharide, in this case the carbohydrate starch in the grain. Want some bonus points in your next distilling trivia competition? Try spelling it. It's saccharification, S-A-C-C-H-A-R-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N. That's sacrification. And if you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Balconis Distilling, the original Texas whiskey at the forefront of the American single malt movement. Exploring place and provenance with unique style whiskeys, ranging from the award-winning Texas One and Lineage American single malts to their baby blue straight corn whiskey and Texas rye bottled in bond. Discover whiskey from a new perspective at balconististilling.com. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and, of course, a complete archive of past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on X, Threads, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast, or you can use the WhiskeyCast community app. Download it today from your app store. Our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. A pair of socks, a book, some suspect ties, a compact tool kit... Oh, another book and a shaving kit. Actually, I could do with that. But anyway, sometimes you've got to take things into your own hands. Go on, treat yourself. Happy Father's Day from Redbreast, proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Jura's Double Double 21-year-old Mizanara Oak Cask Finish is like a worldly whiskey adventure you simply can't miss. Courtesy of your friends at Dewar's. Savor it responsibly. Copyright 2024, Dewar's Blended Scotch Whiskey, 46% alcohol by volume. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2024, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.